I'm very happy and pleased to see. I didn't, uh, you know what, uh, to be very honest, I, I wasn't sure where the people would stay to the last session. So, kol uh, that after <laughs> such an intensive weekend, people are still here. <laughs> and I wish to address one of the major issues in the state of Israel today, but something that definitely has an impact to the entire world jury. And this is something that obviously uh, has been discussed here in America and in many other places. Um, you know, when you speak about uh, separation, between, uh, separation, of, separation of church and state, religion and state, there are many issues that are, in a sense, debatable whether Shabbat, whether the government should have anything to, to say about how does Shabbat have to look in the public sphere in Israel? Uh, should there be something that symbolizes that this is a Jewish country or not? There, there's always been a debate ever since the establishment of the state. It can be a bit about the system of kashrut and uh, many other religious services or aspects of a Jewish state. What is a Jewish state? However, the issues that we'll be discussing today, this is much more than a religion and state. This is something that has implications to the Jewish people, to the future of the Jewish people, to the unity of the Jewish people, to intermarriage, assimilation, all the major problems or challenges that we are facing with in Israel and in the diaspora. And yesterday when I gave a share about challenges of Halacha in postmodern times, in uh, rapidly changing times, I spoke about, about the problem that we have today within the spiritual leadership or rabbinical leadership, which is a system of supervision versus a system of supervision, of having a vision instead of being in a defensive mode and reacting to uh, challenges to try to think a few step, steps further, to see the broader picture, and obviously to be able to give some, to provide with some good answers, solutions, again, for the sake of the future of the entire Jewish people. Not just my sector, my segment, my denomination, my people, but the entire Jewish people. And that's what I will try to uh, discuss today with regards, again, to two major issues, one of them is the issue of uh, conversion in Israel, and the other one is about marriage, civil marriage or, or any other marriage, which is not what we define uh, the halachic or kadat Moshe v'Israel. Before we start dealing with the issues themselves, and I also want to review a little bit of the halacha, the halachic uh, considerations, uh, I wish to make a few comments or statements. First of all, the issue, especially the issue of conversion, it is something that we are carrying with us, not as a burden, rather as a challenge, that is challenging us as, as a nation, as, a peop as, as people, what is our goal, what is our destiny? It relates to our parshot. You know, we read now the parshot of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, the Trumat, the Tzaveh, and afterwards the parshot of Vayakel Pkudei, all these parashot are dealing with what? The building of the Mishkan, uh, commandment, and then the uh, actual building of the Mishkan, the tabernacle. In the middle, we have Parashat Kitisa. that also speaks a little bit about the Mishkan, but what it appears in the essence of Parashat Kitisa? The golden calf. The golden calf, Now, there is an amazing Midrash. Uh, you didn't get the handouts, so please. That'll be great. Uh, because we are, we have, by the way, many sources, because we are short in time, I will not read all of them. I will refer you to some of them, and you're most invited to uh, see them later on. Uh, there's a fascinating midrash about the sin of the golden calf. If you, if you remember the text, when Hashem is speaking to Moshe Rabbeinu, after he received the tablets and uh, is about to uh, descend to the people, Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu, Lech red ki amcha. 
you should go and descend because your people have corrupted. So the Midrash in source number one is sharing a fascinating dialogue. Moshe Rabbeinu is asking God, they are not my people, they are your people. Don't you remember that I said, that you said, let my people go? Remember, the, that's what God said to Paro. Let my people go, they are your people. Why do you say that they are my people? Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu, indeed, at the beginning, they were my people. When we left Egypt, you decided to accept many converts. I didn't want all the Egyptian converts. I didn't want, but you know, I cooperate. That's what the Midrash says. Now they are the ones who cause my people to sin. So these are not my people that they've sinned. These are your people, Moshe Rabbeinu, the, all the converts that you brought with you. These are your people. Again, obviously Moshe Rabbeinu is representing something that we all have inside of us, the willingness to open the gates and to accept people who sincerely want to be part of our nation, part of our destiny, our destination, our goal, our vision, our dream to the world. But at the very same time, it was always a challenge of a balance of a question of identity. And basically that was, I believe, what the Midrash is trying to portray. This is a dilemma. From the very beginning of the formation of our nation, the question of conversion was there. It's not a new question, definitely not today, especially today. After 2,000 years of exile and the beginning of returning to our homeland, which by the way, I mentioned this a couple of times in my presentations, I believe this is the big, biggest miracle in history. You know that the biggest concentration of Jews is today in Israel. It's the first time ever since the destruction of the, of the first temple that this is happening, <coughs> which is according to all the prophecies in the Torah, in the, in, in the prophets, in the Nevim. This is an amazing historical fact. In a few years' time, the majority of Jews will be living in Israel. It's, and, and this will happen. It's unavoidable. But again, it poses new questions, new challenges that uh, we did not face for 2,000 years because for 2,000 years we lived as scattered communities all across the world. But now we have a nation. How do we deal with, with the challenge? There's one, uh, there, sorry, two more statements which I want to make before covering the issue itself. There is a very fundamental essay of Rav Kook first chief rabbi of Israel, which I brought in source number two. We don't have time to read it inside. I'm just, I'm giving you the essence. Prof. Cook in that uh, uh, essay, which is named The Course of Ideas in Am Yisrael, he gives a very vivid description of the way Judaism developed throughout the years. What happened in the time of the first temple, the second temple, the exile, and obviously uh, portraying a vision for the future, how Judaism should look like in the future, future, wherever things that Judaism that we practice today is very similar to the one that we practiced 2,000 years ago, <coughs> 2,500 years ago is completely mistaken. Judaism went through many transformations and transitions. Basically, Rav Kook defines the times of the first temple uh, in his words as the divine idea, meaning there, based on our tradition, there was still prophecy. In the temple, there were still miracles. The divine presence was, in that sense, obvious at that time. And people came up to Jerusalem three times a year to absorb his holiness, his divinity that Jerusalem had to offer. However, so that's the way people met God, not through the commandments, not through the laws, rather through the revelation of God. We did not have commandments. We did not have 
the same format of halakha that we have today. That was the situation in the first temple. By the way, this is something that led to all the idol worshipping that took place in the times of the first temple. Why? Because if there's no structure, what are the consequences? People want to express their spiritual feelings, emotions, and if there's no structure, the first thing they do, they build their own altar, their own mizbeach, and then uh, it deteriorates in that slippery slope to become idol worshiping. That's, that's what happened. So therefore, as a reaction to what happened in the first temple, which very significant institute was established in the times of the second temple? Do you remember? Knesset Gdola. This form of Knesset Gdola, they instituted the Judaism in the way that is more familiar to us today with all the nitty gritty details, all these lots of halachot that are surrounding us from the very first moment when we open our eyes and we, we need to say modeani and we need to recite few brachot till the time that we go to bed everywhere. We go to the bathroom, we have to say a, a blessing on everything we do, the tefillot, the prayers, everything was established in the second temple. That was a structure that was supposed to give a framework. And therefore, says Rav Kook, what was developed in the second temple was the religious idea. We do not meet God as a nation. We encounter God as individuals. Each one with his own way he or she worships God. Through many details, and in a sense, says Rav Kook, and that's the most significant thing that was instituted, this gave us something to hold to, to hold on to for 2,000 years of exile. Because of all these many details and this very structured halacha, this is something that whenever or wherever we went to an, or where, wherever we were exiled to or scattered to, we took with us and this kept the Jewish people alive. That was uh, the shield against assimilation, against losing our identity for almost 2,000 years. So from Judaism that lives as a nation, we transform to Judaism, Judaism that lives as a community, in a best scenario case, many times, the individuals are focused on their own personal individual worship of God. We lost the ability to see a picture of a nation. I mentioned this yesterday. What was the point in time, the first point in time when Halacha was written? The Mishnah. Rabbi Yudanasi. What year was that? 200 which is uh, 200 something, which is uh, almost 150 years after the destruction. Meaning, halacha was never written to a situation that we are living not as a community, not for individuals, but for a nation forming a state, independent state. And this poses many challenges. And it's not, in, we, we will be using the text but we need to have a broader perspective. And one last statement which I wish to make about this broader perspective, sharing with you an amazing example, which are brought in cells number three, three. Again, we don't have time to read. I highly recommend to sit inside. Uh, it's a discussion about Sukkot, about the four species, species about the Arabat Aminim. How should we practice the uh, story of Arabat Aminim? So, uh, it appears in the Gemara that we should uh, gather three of them together, the uh, Lulav, the Arava, the Hadas, the Miracles, we should collect them together. 
But the question is, what about the etrog? How should we hold the etrog? So this is, there's no recollection. And the Shulchan of Rabbi Yosef Karo brings up a story that he has found within one of the Kabbalah sages, the Rakanati. And Rakanati tells the following story. At one Sukkot, he hosted a Hasid, his name was Rabbi Yitzchak. And during the night, he had a dream. And he saw this pious, this Hasid, writing the explicit name of God, you know, the four letters, Yud, K, Vav, K. And he was separating the last letter, the last He, from the rest of the letters. So during the dream, he remembered that he rebuked him. How do you do such a thing? He got up in the morning very upset. What is the story? What's the meaning of the dream? And then they go to Shul, to Daven. And he sees that Hasid holds three of the minim on one hand and the etrog in the other hand without connecting them together. So he told him about his dream and he told him you're doing something which is improper. You should connect them together because you're erasing the name of God. This is what I dreamt overnight. That's the reason why when, today when we practice the four species there about the minim, we hold them together. We connect the etrog to the other. This is a story. There's a phenomenal, phenomenal message behind. Why does the etrog don't... Why does the etrog refuses, refuse to connect to the others? Why do we have to force the etrog to connect to the others? Evil. Exactly. And mitzvot. That's the ultimate, ultimate righteous. He has good deeds. He's fully observant, whatever we define this. The etrog is a perfect example for a righteous person. We know that the etrog is very sensitive. One scratch can invalidate the etrog if it's happening in the wrong place. Very sensitive. He can preach and speak so much about unity, but when it comes to practice, what's the tendency of the etrog? To isolate himself from the other. Sukkot is an educational process for the etrog. We force the etrog against its will to connect to all the others, to see the big picture. And by the way, what do we do towards the end of Sukkot? We put all the minim aside and we take just one of them. Which one? Arava. The Arava, the lowest one. Why? Because if you feel that you are etrog, you still have a problem. You're considering yourself more than the others. You reach the ultimate level of unity when you realize that all of us, we are all Aravot. We are all, in a sense, empty and can learn from the other. That's the process of, of, of Sukkot. This is one of the biggest challenges. Because many times, and that's what, hap what is happening today, for instance, with the chief rabbinate in Israel. The people who are leading are people who see, first of all, consider themselves as the etrogim, and they see only their sector. They don't see the picture of the entire Jewish people. Let's speak about conversion. What is a conversion? Few halachic definitions. It appears in the Gemara, which I brought to source number four, when someone comes, prospective convert comes to convert Let's see what we do. Source number four, I'm reading the second line in the English translation. We inform him of a few mitzvot that carry a lesser penalty and a few that carry a severe penalty. Not everything, just a little bit. A few samples of Judaism. And we inform the grave of importance of living gifts to, for the poor and we inform him of the consequence of violating the mitzvot, saying, 
you should know that until now, when you ate forbidden fat, you were not subject to cover it to, the, uh, to this penalty. And when you violated Shabbat, you were not liable to be stoned. But now, you will be if you are about to accept the mitzvot. But see, see this. But one does not overburden him, nor engage in exacting details. It's a very basic process. That's the conversion based on the Gemara. Once he accepts, if he accepts, there's circumcision and there's immersion in the mikveh, and there, then he's a Jew, he's a complete Jew. Basically, that is the process. The process includes three mandatory stages. Circumcision, for, obviously for men, immersion, and acceptance of the mitzvot. By the way, you can turn the sheet. Uh, you can see an example in source number five in another place in the Gemara that the acceptance of the mitzvot should be unconditional. If a convert comes and says, I'm willing to convert, but there are few areas that I refuse to take upon myself in halacha, even if these are rabbinical decrees, we do not accept him. There has to be full acceptance of the mitzvot. Now, it's a bit strange. I have a question. Again, regardless, I know we have people from different denominations, whatever we define as an observant Jew. Is there anyone in this room that can testify that he or she observes all the mitzvot? Is there anyone, <laughs> is there anyone, I'm asking myself included, that never speaks Lashon Hara? I wish, Alevai. Beings, we, we need to explain what is the acceptance of the mitzvot. That's, that's exactly what we need to explain. By the way, I can, one of the uh, fundamental questions that was asked, I guess many of us are familiar with the stories of Hillel and the converts. You remember Maseret Shabbat? There's a series of three stories. Uh, one of them, one of the converts, wanted to learn the entire Torah on one foot. And what did he tell him? You remember, Masha Sanolecha, what you had done do to your fellow friend. Hold on a second. How did Hillel accept him if that convert accepted only one mitzvah? How can it be? Right? It's contradictory to what we said. So this is a discussion in the Tosfot. Uh, you can see this in, in source number uh, six. Uh, I'll read the English, but in the second chapter of Shabbat, there's one who came to Hillel and asked to be converted in condition that he will he be made a high priest, the Kohen Gadol. That's one of the three stories. Hillel was certain that it will ultimately be for heaven's sake. Hillel had the capacity to see afar, to see the outcomes. He, he knew the convert, he realized that in the end, he will accept uh, the mitzvot. So wh what do we see from this? And that's been brought up to halacha. Uh, you, you can see it uh, in source number 11 as an example. I'm not reading this inside, just referring you to the source in the Shach, in the Bet Yosef, in many of the poskim. That in the end of the day, it's all subjected to the judgment of the Beidin, of the rabbinical court, because they are there. They see the person face to face. They can realize and think whether he, should be, he or she uh, will be a serious convert. So we see that there is an acceptance of the mitzvot, but this is a broad concept that we need to define what is, what is it exactly. It definitely does not mean that from day one we expect the convert to observe 100% of the mitzvot because this is something that none of us is doing. Uh, anyways, you can see I brought it in source number uh, seven in the, the words of Rambam and Shuchan Aruch. They are all saying the same. 
about the conversion process, which is uh, it's a reflection of what was said in the Gemara. There's three items of circumcision, of immersion, and acceptance of the mitzvot. These are the three mandatory issues. By the way, one more very significant anecdote, which appears in source number 10, in, in the Shukhan Aruch, and again, it's based on the Rambam and based on the Gemara. Let's see it in the last sentences. Um, <clears throat> in the three last sentences in the English, source number 10. And even if he returned to worship in a non-Jewish way, meaning worshiping idols, behold, he's like an, <clears throat> an apostate Jew, that his Kiddushin marriage is still Kiddushin. In other words, conversion is something e reversible. All this new, forgive me for saying this nonsense of canceling your making a conversion void, this is something which is against halacha. It's completely against halacha. Once someone has converted, it's irreversible. So let's try to understand, to define what's the meaning of the acceptance of the mitzvot. One of the first authorities, by the way, again, to be honest and to give you the uh, full range of opinions, there are definitely opinions of rabbis till this very day, many of them, and there are, it, it's based on the earlier authorities that understand the acceptance of the literally, that we expect the convert to be observ an observant Jew. However, there are many other opinions, and I brought some of them here. And the reason why I'm focusing on them, first of all, to, to show that these are very prominent authorities, but then to try to see the big picture. So one of the first uh, uh, courageous uh, to vote response was the one of the Reb Chaim Oizer, source number 12, the Shuta Chiezer. And he was trying to struggle with what is an unconditional conversion. Because we saw that the conditional conversion is invalid. And he says, obviously, how can we expect the convert to observe everything from day one? And he says something very interesting. We need to distinguish between someone that has an ideology refuses to accept part, certain parts of Judaism to someone who does not do it out of ideology, it's, it's just not ready yet, or she's just not ready yet to accept everything. So there's a true willingness to become part of the story. But it's a process. In other words, the acceptance of the mitzvot is not the end of the way. That's the first station in a long journey. It begins then, but it's a journey of spiritual growth. We are all, that's, I believe that's about being a Jew. Being a Jew means that you are always in a spiritual growth. Always you want to know more. That's why you spend your weekend here, because you want to know more. You want to learn more. We want to learn more. Want to be closer to God? That's the meaning of being a Jew. So he's beginning, that's basically what the Achizer is saying. If he accept the mitzvot, I'll read one sentence. Because he's willing to accept all the mitzvot, he's willing to completely enter the system, even if there are few things that he, will, he knows that he will transgress. Meaning because he is not in that level yet. This is not something which is avoiding, which is preventing the concept of Kabbalah, result of acceptance of the mitzvot because he is fully entering the system, but we realize that this is a process of spiritual growth. By the way, Rav Moshe finds him uh, completely opposed. I brought Rav Moshe in source number 13. He said that this is not a conversion. Uh, yeah, he had his own reasons. It's, it also uh, it relates to some of the struggle that took place here in America. Uh, but uh, again, I'm, my focus now is, is Israel. You can see it uh, uh, 
is an example, another example of source number 14. Rav Rate was one of the, uh, in the uh, earlier stages of the state, one of the leading rabbis in the chief rabbinate. Once we had a different chief rabbinate than today. Uh, and he says, Bizmanen, source number 14. The entire situation of Amisel has changed. Most Jews are not coming to Limud. Most Jews that do not belong to any denomination. This is something we've never faced as a nation. So when someone wants to become part of the nation, we need to take this in account. And therefore he says, and if so, we cannot give general rule of what is acceptance of the mitzvot. We need to count on the words of Tosfot, if you remember, that we need to operate the judgment, use the judgment of the court. But he says, we need to give basic things, like Shabbat, like Nida, like uh, Kashrut, basic things. These are the things which we need to tell them Again, realizing that this is the beginning of a way of being part of Am Yisrael. Rav Uziel, in a very famous uh, uh, set of uh, responses, I uh, brought them in source number 16. Again, we don't have time to read. I highly recommend that you will see, uh, see the text inside. He says this very explicitly. There is a value of converting people, even if they do not accept the mitzvot, especially, especially, and that's what he elaborates on, if they are Zera Israel, if they have some Jewish blood, meaning they have one of their ancestors is Jewish, even if halakhically they are not considered Jewish, Jews, we have, you know, usually, we are not a missionary religion. If someone wants to convert, so we tell him and we accept him. We accept, we do not invite to convert. But if someone was, someone is in his family was Jewish, we have a mitzvah, and I'll tell you a story in a second. We have a mitzvah, a commandment, a positive commandment to try and actively encourage him to convert, to bring him or her back to Judaism. And he says, Rav Ziel, that in, especially in these cases, even if they do not accept the mitzvot, we are saving them. And if we will, if we will re reject them, we have response, historical responsibility for the damage we are causing to the Jewish people. Again, everything is inside. You can see, you can see his words. Very similar things were said by another uh, uh, one of the leading rabbis in, in the past, in the early stages of, of the state, uh, Rav Moshe Cohen, he was the chief rabbi of Jer Jerba, and then he came on Aliyah, source number 19. Again, uh, everything is there. It's also translated. You can read it afterwards. I want to speak about situation in Israel today. In Israel today, we have about 300,000 people that are not considered Jews based on halacha. They came from the, most of them from the, from the FSU, from the Soviet, Soviet Union. Most of them, vast majority of them are what's called the Israel children of Jews. Now, the second and third, the Aliyah started in the 1980s. Today, many of them belong to the second, some of them even to the third generation. They are completely Israelis. In their culture, mentality, language, names, they are part of the Jewish society, very integral part of the Jewish society. They serve in the army, celebrate the Chagim, like every one of us. They feel Jews in their hearts. They are part of the, of the Jewish society. How many conversions are, conversions are taking place in Israel every year? Do you have a clue? Not many. No, a little bit more, 1,500. How many babies are being born to that population every year? 4,000 4, 4, babies. 
So in 10 years time, we can find ourselves with maybe 400, 500,000 people that are completely immersed in the society, completely Israelis, regard themselves as Jews, living amongst us. The biggest risk of, a sem of intermarriage will be where? In Israel, not in the diaspora. Because again, if someone goes to the army and he meets Shira, she's Israeli, she's like everyone. And then they want to get married, and he realizes that she is coming from a Russian family and she's not halakhically Jew. What do they care? She feels a Jew, he feels a Jew. I'm not marrying someone from, I don't know where, from, from China. She's a Jew. So the rabbis say that she's not, it's their problem, it's not my problem. And they get, get married, that, that will be the situation. If we are taking the stringent opinion, and uh, you can see again. I brought another chief, uh, another two other chief, uh, other two chief rabbis. Uh, Rab Unterman was uh, the third chief rabbi of Israel in source number seventeen. It says exactly the same. We are creating risk for assimilation in the state of Israel. Uh, I brought Shara Shuva Cohen, who um, quoted Rav Gorin, was also chief rabbi, that said exactly the same. Again, we have, unfortunately, today a very different political chief rabbi in it. That was not in the past. Chief rabbis of the past, they, had, they were able to see the entire picture, not just the etrog, not just the interests of their sector. Listen, the Haredi sector, they will not be aff affected because if one of their children will meet this Shira, probably she will convert. But this, this will hurt most of the other Jews living in Israel and in the diaspora. But they don't care because they see just the etrog. That's a problem. Because we see there are so, such a broad foundations in Allah to solve the issue. And by the way, what is happening today with conversions? So that's the biggest absurd. They teach people in the, the Ulpanim, the conversion classes, they teach them to memorize the halachot. They are learning so, so many idiotic riddles of halachot. They don't get inspiration. They go to the test, they pass the test, and guess what? Do they observe anything the day after? Most of them? Nada, as we say in Russian. <laughs> no. Why? Because if you don't realize that this is a process, they feel that they're fooling Beidin, and they pass the test, and then they do whatever they want. It's all a big fake. If you realize, and we know we are realistic, that they will not be observant from day one. But it's a process. We can give them inspiration, something to aspire to. Everything will be different. It will all be different. If you'll focus not on all the details, but give them experience like here, bring them to Shabbat like here, like in, in something unforgettable. That they will want to have an experience of Shabbat. That's the way we, it should be. Not, not teaching all the different halachot of Shabbat. That will not be productive for if you want to achieve the goal. Especially when the Dayanim don't have any personal connection with them. I want to share with you a story. For me, it was an eye opener. I'm a, thank you. So I'm a a member in the Beit Din, uh, in the court of uh, Rav Riskin, that Rav Riskin and Rav Rabinovich established recently. Rav Seth Farber, the uh, new Beit Din that is trying to, uh, to uh, beat the system, Bezat Hashem. <laughs> and <laughs> unfortunately, listen, uh, unfortunately, we, don't, we did not have any other choice. Anyways, uh, Last month, uh, last month we, um, we had a, an amazing case. I cried. The guy, his name is Adrian. He's coming from Moldova. His family came in Aliyah when he was five. He told, told us our, his story. That ever since they came to Israel, they had no piece of no taste and smell of Judaism. Completely, completely 
uh, unaffiliated, disconnected, detached. When all his friends celebrated Bar Mitzvah, obviously he did not. He knew that he's not, like, it wasn't a discussion even in the, on their table. Anyways, when he was 18, he went to a mechina. It's kind of a pre-army uh, 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 institution that they teach them values and leadership, whatever, a year before the army in order to make them better soldiers. And then it's the first time that he started learning about Jewish history and what happened to Judaism. And then he, tell, he told us, and that's the first time that, you know, all the sources, at least for me, came alive. I started to cry. Every, everyone started to cry. He, he cried. He said to us, I realized that the reason my grandfather intermarried in Russia wasn't because of his fault. It's the fault of 2,000 years of exile. Because we were scattered and so Jews in some places where they did not, ha did not have a strong community assimilated. And he tells us, and I at that moment felt and realized that I need to do the tikkun. I need to repair the damage that my grandfather was forced to, to damage because of the situation Jews <laughs> in 2,000 years of exile of diaspora. Again, and you see a person that says, I'm here to do the tikkun. That's just a conversion. Now, he told us a story. He came to the Beit of the Rabbanut. It's a true story. And he told them the story, whatever. that. And they asked him. He started putting on feeling and uh, observe. He had lots of motivation. And they asked him, are you putting feeling for, sorry, the question of the, the Dayan was as follows. What is Le'ot al Yadecha? What is Le'ot al Yadecha? Sign on your hand, right? Which is supposed to be that feeling? Well, he said, like, it was overwhelmed. What are we talking about? So the Dayan shouts at him, feeling, feeling, do you put on feeling every single day? So he says to the Dayan, I'm trying, usually I'm putting on feeling 70% of the times. He was trying to be very honest, very... Frank with, so the Dayan told him, go away. He was devastated. He came with so much uh, passion, to com he was completely devastated. It took him a year to pick himself back with his girl, thanks to his girlfriend. And by the way, they're living together. Baydin would not convert them because of this. We converted him. It was clear that he, and I invited him to spend Shabbos in my shul, uh, the, the next Shabbos. And I asked him to tell his story from the pulpit instead of my sermon, which he did. Everyone cried. They had an unforgettable Shabbat. They are becoming Shabbat observant in their own way. Both of them, there's no question, it's a process. But everything they went through and the, the fact that me, one of the, the Dayanim, I, I had a personal connection with him. He changes the entire experience. His conversion is much more valid than all the conversion that are done by the Rabbanut. Because that's the essence of conversion. But again, we don't see the, we see just a narrow picture. That's why we, we have this issue. It's all about seeing the broader picture. I want to give you, uh, in the last uh, 10 minutes that we have, uh, I want to give you another example of the civil marriage in Israel. You know, the reason why we do not have a civil marriage in Israel is because uh, what the Haredi parties told the Ben Gurion, and this is, what, this is what he promised them, you can see it in source number 20. We will do everything in our power, in our power to satisfy the needs of the keepers of the faith in this regard, to prevent the people of Israel from being divided into two. As, um, he mentioned that's, that's about, that's the reason why we don't have civil marriage in Israel. 
they told him, which by the way, this is what I was told before I started learning the sources, that the problem is not with the civil marriage, it's with the civil divorce. Meaning that if there's a couple living together, even without marriage, the fact that they live together, this sets the Kiddushin Kedat Moshe Yisrael because there are three ways of Kiddushin. One of them is with the ring, but one of them is with having uh, relations in their course. And that's a, a couple that lives like a married couple. This, in theory, is regarded as halachic marriage. And therefore, even if they decide to marry in civil marriage, it requires a halachic divorce. And when the halachic divorce is not done, so then you encounter problem of adultery of what we call eshetish, mamzerut, whatever. And that's the reason why, uh, that's what they told Ben-Gurion, that this will pose many issues. The question is, is it really true? So one of the very interesting precedents in the past, which by the way was brought to Halacha by the Shulchan Aruch, you can see the source number 22, but I'm reading source number 23, it's a Ribash of Yitzchak ben Sheshet from the 14th century, uh, 15th century, sorry. Uh, this was a question that was asked about the Morenos. There was a couple that got married in a church. Now the husband escaped. And the question was whether they should get a divorce. Meaning wh whether she should get a divorce or whether, whether she could, could be remarried. Because again, as we said, there's this assumption that if they live together and they have regular relations in their course, this is uh, uh, probably he did it as a, a part of the Kiddush, and therefore they are married and they need a divorce. So let's see what he says, the Ribas, source number 23. Because they're, they conditioned their marriage on emulating idolaters because they went to the church. In the church and with a ceremony officiated by a priest. So, so it is as if they determined that they have no intention of getting married in accordance with the faith of, Mo of Mo Moses and Jewish tradition. How can he say that this is Kadat Moshe Yisrael when they went to a church to get married? But rather, to do so following the footsteps of the idolaters who are not subject to the laws of the Kiddushin and Gitin. The woman, therefore, is not halachically married. That's what he was ruling. Because they deliberately, when the Gemara and the halacha spoke about a couple living together that are regarded as married, is if they did not do anything, uh, any act to protest against Jewish marriage. And just, they just didn't do the Kiddushin, so we regard them as a married couple. But if they went to a church, so then forget it. They are not married. In later generations, when civil marriage started uh, playing a role, there was a very heated debate between few authorities. Some authorities, like in America, like Rav Henkin, which are brought in source number 24, he claimed that we cannot derive anything from that precedent of the Ribash. Why? Because if people go, want to do civil marriage, it's not an indication that they are not interested in a marriage Kedat Moshe Yisrael, according to the laws of Moses and Jewish people. That's not an indication. And therefore, he opposed to, uh, uh, he said that even if there's a, a civil marriage taking place, it requires halachic divorce. However, and there were some other authorities, it was him, Rob Price, and some other authorities. Most rabbinical, prominent rabbinical authorities in our time claim that this, this does not require any halachic get. I brought Rabbi Vadia, source number, Rabbi Vadia, source number 25. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein says this very explicitly in source number 26. He says, you can, let's read the English in source number 26. The couple perhaps want to get married only in a civil context. They do not wish to fulfill their obligation towards heaven. Meaning, the fact that they went to civil a civil court, that's an indication they're not interested. It's exactly like the church. And also, uh, also Tzitz Eliezer, one of the greatest post uh, in Israel, passed away about 10 years ago. 
Uh, many others, there's Rav Shaul Israeli, there are many authorities that are asking that this is, again, it's exactly like the story in the church. Once they decide they want a civil marriage, it doesn't require halachic divorce because that's a, a statement that we are not interested in getting married Kedat Moshe Israel. However, again, we know that there are many times, especially in these sensitive issues, if there are authorities saying otherwise, uh, this might be a problem. Therefore, for that reason, there's something very simple to solve the issue. And this is something that uh, we suggested and it was placed in uh, most of the legislation uh, uh, that is now being processed in Israel. And again, that's a place of rabbis, not just to react, but to have a vision. Something very simple. If a couple that want to get married in civil marriage in Israel, if they sign on a statement that says explicitly that we are not interested in getting married to that Moshe Yisrael, then the story is done. Because you don't have to assume what did they think when they decided to take a civil marriage, whether they want it or not. Once they sign, uh, sign on that statement, that's a clear indication we are not interested. That's the end of the story. They are not interested, and therefore, it doesn't require halachic get, and you can have that system in Israel without splitting the nation to two, having the halachic system and having the civil system. Now, I will tell you honestly, I did more than 800 weddings in Israel, free of charge for non-religious couples. Because I think that's a role to make it very inspiring, user-friendly. That's what I'm trying to do as much, much as possible. But this is something we cannot make a cohesion, because cohesion is counterproductive. We, Again, it's, the question is, do we see the whole picture or just one small uh, segment of, uh, fragment of the picture? You know, I'll give you, to, why don't we have any single car driving on Yom Kippur in Israel? You know why? You know why? Because there's no legislation or any law that prohibits people to drive on Yom Kippur. <laughs> Had there been a law, many people would have so, You know why? 99% of Israelis, they do Brit Milah. It's cruel to take a young infant and do the circumcision. Why do they do this against everywhere? You know why? There's no law forcing. If, if there won't be coercion, more people will be connected to Judaism. I truly believe that if you provide this, again, service, this approach, and having the option of civil marriage, which again, can be done in a way which is not irreversible, if you do a simple solution, just thinking creatively, it can solve the issue, and people can, get, can, can be free to decide how and where they want to get married, and the issue is, is solved. And I believe that m most of them still will choose, but now will be out of choice, to get married at that Moshe Bissel. Anyways, I apologize, I have to escape. I want to thank you so much for a lovely conference, for listening. And to be continued, to the Alba. What? We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.